we are back in a LS 6.2 L94 used to be my favorite engine it still is a great engine I've got a very similar engine in my JK I've got an L9H which is essentially the same engine as this without the active fuel management this engine has all aluminum construction higher compression variable valve timing active fuel management and flex fuel capability not that you're going to use flex fuel in a JK but between 2008 and 9 GM changed a lot of their engines from straight gasoline to flex fuel using a virtual sensor as we talked about in the last video so these injectors are larger they flow more than the earlier injectors so you can get more performance out of these engines now the L94 the L99 the L99 is the LS3 counterpart for the for the passenger cars like the Corvette and the Camaro they run automatic transmissions variable valve timing active fuel management and flex fuel capability the LS3 and the 6 liter LY6 and L96 do not. The LY6 and the L96 do run variable valve timing, but they don't run active fuel management because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense in a heavy duty truck. The LS3 separates itself from the L99 in that it has an automatic transmission where the LS3 is a manual transmission really more geared around performance. So it has fewer parts, it doesn't have variable valve timing, it has high compression, and they wanted to keep that engine simple for the track, basically high performance use. So the L94 has all the whistles and bells, and does it make sense to put it in a JK? Yeah, it absolutely does. What are the advantages of this LS over the LT? And you know, we're gonna be talking about this for a while, guys, because the LTs have been out for a lot of years now, and we've been supporting them for over three years. And I get calls and guys say, well, I really wanna go with the LT. And some of them end up going with the LS, the LS 6.0 is a great expedition engine. It is very solid. It has an iron block. And as I mentioned in a previous video, the new iron block replacement for the L96, the 6.6 .6 liter LT, is not exactly rationalized from what I understand from my GM sources. So if you want an expedition engine that you can beat up, run the cheapest fuel you can find, overheat it, it's got an iron block, run it in extreme cold, the L96 is still your choice. Where does the 6.2 LS come in? The 6.2 LS is a great motor. It has over 400 horsepower. It'll pull your JK with ease. It is using the six speed transmission, which the 6L80 is still a modern adaptive transmission. The eight speed and the 10 speeds do have a little bit of advantage with the larger tires. There's no doubt about that, but the six speed is still an excellent transmission and miles ahead of the old four speeds and five speeds that Chrysler offers. Some of the other advantages is these engines were produced for a long, long time. And there's millions of them in wrecking yards. The installation kit is a lower cost. We have a promotion going on our LS kits right now. The installation is easier, or should I say simpler. We're reusing most of your original accessories, alternator, power steering pump, AC compressor, power steering lines, air conditioning lines. The kit is completely bolt-in. There is no fabrication. And here's one of the most important things that we're going to talk about and probably a lot of you don't want to hear about, and that is emissions. A lot of you guys in California are stressing out because you got hammies with the monitors removed or you've got superchargers or turbochargers without executive orders. MoTeC has an executive order with the California Air Resource Board, and essentially there's two main authorities that certify these vehicles. One is the US EPA. So a manufacturer goes to the US EPA to get engines certified, and not just engines, or powertrains. And that's where a lot of companies run into problems, like if you look at the Cummings 2.8 diesel, that engine was really never put into a production vehicle. So it was never certified by the US EPA, and that's why they are having a really hard time trying to get it certified in production OBD2 vehicles, because it was never installed in the vehicle. There is no baseline on that engine. Well, there is a baseline on the LSs. The LSs were put in vehicles since the late 90s. The Gen 4s were put in vehicles since the mid-2000s. We secured an executive order with the California Air Resource Board for the LS because the majority of components we're using are OE components that were certified by the US EPA. This includes the wiring harnesses, the engine controllers, the operating systems, the calibrations, etc. Now would it have been easier to hybrid or would it have been easier to put a Hemi in? Probably so. But to get that certification to make it smog legal in virtually all 50 states, 
means that we have to mimic what the manufacturer did as closely as we can. And that's what we did, and that's why we secured an executive order. Now this Jeep runs awesome with a 6.2. It doesn't struggle at all. It's cruising at low RPM, as you can see here. It's got plenty of torque. It's got plenty of horsepower. Now if you wanted to crunch the numbers and you wanted to do a side-by-side -side comparison with an LT, I think the results are going to be obvious. But stepping up from what he had to what he has now is massive. And going from this to an LT is not so massive. So what this customer got is lower cost, extreme reliability, really good performance. I can't tell you how many miles I put in my JK with a smile on my face with a 6.2 LS. And I'm talking about driving my JK from the west coast to the east coast, down south into Texas, all over the place. It gets reasonably good economy. I never struggle with power, even fully loaded with my family. And I can take it off-road and do whatever I want with it. So that's what this guy got for a reasonable price. Now, what this Jeep has to do, which currently an LT, most Hemis, and other modifications can't do, it's tougher than crossing the Rubicon. It's tougher than going through Fordyce. This Jeep has to pass a California emissions test. Now let's talk about this a little, and I've been kind of keeping it off the channel, because emissions are really something most of you guys don't want to talk about. One of the first questions I ask guys when they call me is, are you subject to emissions? And down south in the Midwest, guys say, oh no, we don't have that here. And that, that may be a good thing, it may be a bad thing, but here's the deal. You may have it there someday, you may not. You may go the life of the vehicle as the sole owner and never have an emissions inspection in your jurisdiction. But you could also sell that JK. And if you sell that JK and that customer takes it to a jurisdiction that does do emissions inspections, so let's say Colorado or California, and it gets flagged for tampering, you are responsible for that tampering. Above and beyond that, there's federal laws, US EPA rules, about tampering. So it doesn't matter where you're at. You could be in the middle of Alabama with no emissions inspections and drive your JK for, like I said, the life of the vehicle and never have a problem. But the reality is you still are breaking the law because the US EPA federal rules say that you can't do that. Now the big word that really comes into play here is enforcement. Every jurisdiction is under the same US EPA rules. Every jurisdiction has their own right to modify or enhance the rules, which is what California, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and a bunch of other states, including the back east states like Massachusetts, New York, have done. So now we've got really two sets of regulations or statutes that we got to look at, the federal and at the state level. And then you may have some county and city rules that you have to deal with. If you're in Los Angeles County, you have one of the most difficult emissions inspections of any place in the country. In California, they're doing calibration verification or CVN testing. They literally plug into your vehicle and they no longer just look for monitors. A lot of you guys know that back in the day, the analyzers looked at the monitors that were active in the vehicle and use those for testing. And if you took a hammy and you turned all the monitors off, that analyzer would pass the vehicle because all the monitors said not supported. Around 2015, enforcement got wise to that and they came up with pretty much foolproof ways of testing your vehicle. So when you take a calibration verification number and you compare it to the OE manufacturer's CVN, you're pretty much screwed. You're not gonna get around that. Now there are ways to get around it, of course. Register your vehicle out of state, pay somebody off, etc but I was an emissions inspector for over 20 years, so I choose to go a different route. And I highly encourage you guys to stay legal. Because even today, if you're not subject to emissions, you may be someday. I have dealt with the Department of Air Quality in Arizona. I've dealt with a lab in Colorado. I've dealt with them in Wisconsin, of all places. And motor vehicle departments across the country are looking to step up emissions enforcement. Now, if you're in a rural area, probably less than 50,000 people, you probably have no worries. In fact, even here in Clark County, in Nevada, we have two counties that do emissions inspections, Clark and Washout. But in cities or provinces that have less than 50,000 people, they're not subject to emissions testing. So if you intend to keep your vehicle, if you don't intend to register it, I have a guy in Arizona that owns his own farm and he doesn't register his vehicle for on-road use. But if you register your vehicle for on-road use, you intend to sell it someday, your area is just on the outskirts of a major city like Phoenix, take for example. Same thing up in Utah, Salt Lake has been threatening for years to bring emissions inspections down to St. George and Hurricane and Southern Utah. So if you're worried about that, why not just make your Jeep legal? Now, as I stated, I've been in enforcement for a lot of years as an emissions G2 level inspector. Now, one of the reasons Motec went in the direction they did is exactly for this reason, is to keep your Jeep legal. 
if you have a manufacturer that says, well, this is for off-road use only, and many of them have, and then a lot of that manufacturer's Jeep show up at emissions labs, the emission labs realize that there's something going on here and there's been several lawsuits over that. So the reason we went in the direction we did, which is to keep the powertrain pure GM, and let me say that we have been refining that over the years. It was very difficult to do at first to interface or bridge, but as time went on and technology advanced and we went to the CAN module, it got easier and easier and easier, and we have basically simplified this down to almost an OE level. So to hybrid, meaning to take an LS and put it into a Chrysler operating system, unless you have an executive order, it's not going to be legal. To take a Hemi and patch the V6 operating system, meaning leave all your Mode 6 data, which is the emissions monitoring data, in the ECM, and then bring in a calibration or patch in a V8 calibration is not going to be legal. Your CVNs are going to be all over the place. Now, I'm not saying there's not certified configurations out there, but what I am saying is most of them are not. And our mission goal from day one was to stay legal. And we knew this from day one. We knew there were alternatives. We knew there was other routes to do this. Now, I've been dealing with the Air Resource Board, the BAR, SEMA, the Department of Consumer Affairs, and other authorities in California and bureaus. And I can tell you that we have made really good progress with them. I'm not going to say a whole lot about it, but we're fighting for your rights to have these V8 Jeeps available to you in California. And the bottom line is, you can't go against the rules, you can't go around the rules, you got to go with the rules. And if you don't, sure, you can get away for some short term, you can get your vehicle certified, you can get your vehicle registered, but in the end, they're probably going to get you. So what this customer has is an engine that runs awesome. It is not the latest and greatest state-of-the-art technology, but it's pretty darn close. This Jeep will not lack for horsepower. This Jeep will cruise at any speed this customer wants. This engine may outlast this Jeep. That's how long these LSs go. The price point in this install is less than an LT, and let's face it, it's fun to drive. So when you take all those factors and you add them up, this is a pretty incredible build. Putting a V8 in a Jeep, making it fun to drive, making it do what you want, getting reasonable economy, and getting it certified by CARB. And that's huge for a lot of customers. Other customers, like I said, couldn't care less. But for the majority of us, as I've been saying for the last decade in my videos, this is going to be something that all of us are going to have to deal with in the future. So why not do it right? Now these newer builds are enjoying the simplicity of our electronics. When we go to the single module system, I really don't see it getting any better than that because we're really going to be virtually at an OE level of parts count. We've refined it down to pretty much as far as you can go. But driving this Jeep brings back a lot of memories because when I first put that 403 horsepower L9H into my 09 Rubicon, it was revolutionary. Back in that day, to go from a 3.8 to a 400 horsepower LDS, was there was nothing like it. Sure, there were Hemis out there. We were working on the Hemis with the five speeds and they had the old 545 RFE. Couldn't hold a candle to a 6.2 all aluminum six speed LS. It really was revolutionary. And by 2010 to 12, everybody else realized that. And a lot of other manufacturers jumped into the fray. But we always tried to stay with the philosophy of keeping it legal for the guys in California, the guys in Colorado and other areas where emissions are becoming more and more prevalent and that was the hard part could we have done it easier with hot rod harnesses with reduced wire counts with reduced power distribution and ground distribution and hybrid it meaning make it just work inside of a inside of a Chrysler operating system sure we could have done that and we could have done that with mostly software integration but we chose not to because the more we mimic what the manufacturer is doing when you have a GM engine a GM transmission a GM computer a GM harness and all this stuff runs the same way it would in a GM truck the advantages are massive and the fact that we're working with the California authorities and the fact that we're getting these vehicles certified and guys are enjoying them on the road without their conscience or without that fear of oh man you know when it comes time to sell it or what happens if if I get flagged that you know next time I go for an inspection to me is a really big thing and after 20 years of doing what I was doing when I'd have a guy come in with an engine conversion and I was a G2 inspector so not only did I have to inspect but I had to know the theory and operation so I could tell and interpret and this is a big thing because without an executive order basically referees and emissions inspectors have to leave it up to interpretation in the old days we used to do tailpipe testing and some of the states still do like California where we actually read the gases we read the HC's which is raw gasoline the CO's which is partially burned gasoline the NOx which you know what that is that's where oxygen and and uh, nitrogen melt together 
um, and, and there's CO2, and we would literally take a reading on this. Onboard Diagnostics has eliminated a lot of that in most states. Bar 96 basically plugs into the data link connector, it looks at the monitors, it looks at the codes, and tests your vehicles based on that. It's a very inexpensive, easy test to do, and it's pretty accurate, because assuming your monitors are fully active and you go through the drive cycles, onboard diagnostics is very accurate, but it's also very easily defeated, meaning it can be disabled. Guys can go in there and turn monitors off like the Hemi guys have been doing. You can hybrid it, a GM engine in a, in a, with a Chrysler transmission and get around what is a certified configuration and then through software, make it work. Now with CVN testing, it's a whole different level because really what enforcement is doing is saying, do whatever you want to your vehicle. Put a turbocharger on it, put a supercharger on it, put a V8 in it. When that vehicle gets to our emissions inspection station, we're gonna plug in and we're gonna pull that calibration out. And we're gonna compare it to the OE production calibration that was certified by the US EPA or CARB. And if it doesn't match, you're gonna lose your registration. So that's the level of emissions inspections we're getting to. And know that a big part of Motec's battle has not just been doing these engine conversions, it's been doing them and trying to keep them legal. And we have spent a lot of money doing this with the cross-manufacturer OBD2 swap. In fact, I think our executive order on the LS is the first cross-manufacturer OBD2 swap V8 swap ever, ever issued by the by the ARB and they're breaking new ground. So enough of the rambling, let's hit the road with a 6.2 LS and we'll see you in the next video.